The information for today's video comes from the victim's autobiography titled My Lobotomy, a memoir by Howard Dulley and Charles Fleming. It's a shorter book. It's about 300 pages and I listened to it on audiobook and it was a nine hour listen. I'll also tag a couple other references I use in this video. Um, they can be found on Howard's YouTube channel. So if you're interested in learning more about him, I would recommend reading and watching those videos as well. So welcome to So Sad Stories of Survival and Death, a series where I talk about people in horrific situations, their lives, and how they either survived or died in that situation. If that interests you, please like and subscribe and let's get into today's video. Howard August Dulley was born November 30th, 1948 in Oakland, California to Rodney and June Dulley. He was their first child and June absolutely adored and loved him and doted on him. And even when his younger brother Brian was born about when he was two and a half years old, she still devoted all of her attention to Howard. He was the most important person in the world to her. And so they had this really strong connection. Rodney had more of a traditional stance on fatherhood. He was the provider. He took care of the finances. He did all of that and June was the one who took care of the kids and gave them attention and Rodney wasn't a very affectionate person either. So Howard was really close to his mother and had a very strong bond with her, but Rodney was more of an absent father. He wasn't really there for his children throughout their lives because he was more career driven and had a strong work ethic so he was more concentrated on providing and taking care of, of his family. The family moved around the area a lot. I don't really think they left the Oakland area. It seems like they kind of stayed there, but they moved around quite a bit uh, with Rodney taking on various jobs and they weren't rich by any means they were they were fairly poor but howard and brian grew up pretty happy and well taken care of when howard was about four june got pregnant again and just like she had with her two other pregnancies she went to live with her mother for the last few months of that pregnancy but there was something wrong with this pregnancy and when their youngest brother Bruce was born, he was born brain damaged and the doctor said he only had a half a brain. I'm not sure if that was like an actual physical deformity or if it was some sort of injury like uh, cerebral palsy. I'm not sure exactly what his brain damage was, but he had mental problems and he wasn't expected to live long at all but because of all the issues that were going on with bruce doctors either failed to notice or brushed symptoms off onto the pregnancy that there was something wrong with june as well and after she gave birth she kept declining and 12 days after bruce was born she died at autopsy they discovered that she had peritonitis caused by undiagnosed colon cancer and she died hours after her colon perforated before june died one of the last things she did was change howard's name she added a middle name pierce to his name so he was howard august pierce dolly and howard doesn't really know why she did this it caused some problems um rodney obviously had an issue with this he didn't agree to this 
and so it's not really known if they were having marital problems during this time, but that's something significant to know, I guess. And then June's mother and brother tried to get custody of Howard and Brian soon after June's death because they felt like Rodney was a lousy father, but nothing ever came of this. And Howard wasn't aware of any of this at the time. I mean, he was only four years old, so he didn't really know what was going on. He found out about this later. And Howard wasn't told that June had died, just that she was gone and she wasn't coming back. And this led to Howard having feelings of being unloved and and feeling abandoned. He felt like it was his fault that his mother didn't love him anymore and so she was gone. And these feelings only intensified because Rodney wasn't an affectionate person either. So Howard wasn't getting the comfort and the love that he needed to feel validated and to feel like he had people there for him. Howard's family stayed with family for a little while until they were able to get back on their feet. And even though Bruce survived, he never went to live with them. He was instead taken care of by someone else. The community helped the family a lot. They would host dinners or bring by dinners. They would do laundry, do child care, clean the house. They just were helping Rodney out in every way that they could. They had a really good community. And one of the women who came to help was a single mother named Shirley Lucille Hardin, referred to as Lou. And Rodney and Lou became very close and then soon after they were married. After June's death, Howard became extremely fearful. He would have terrible nightmares and he would cry a lot. He became very emotional and more withdrawn. And this was probably due to the trauma of losing his mother and especially not being told why she wasn't coming back. So when Lou came into the picture, he resented her. This wasn't his mother, but she was portraying herself as his mother, and he didn't like that. And Lou and Howard had very different personalities. Lou was very strict, very orderly. The house had to be perfect. The children had to be perfect. She was all about having this perfect appearance and she also was not very affectionate at all so howard had a really hard time connecting to her and because of this resentment he had that she was trying to take the place of his mother he would fight with her a lot and he would do things to kind of irritate her and she would punish him a lot. Howard always felt like he could never do anything right and that Lou hated him and he didn't understand why or what he had done to make her hate him. But she just seemed to absolutely loathe him and she didn't want anything to do with him. He was in trouble for everything that he did. He got in trouble more than his brothers because she had two other children so it was a, now a family of four boys but he just was always the one that was in trouble and always the one that was punished and he was punished for things that he didn't do that his brothers had done but Lou still took it out on Howard and even if it came out later that this other brother had done this thing. By then, Lou's anger over it was over, and the other brother wasn't punished. But he was never apologized to for being falsely accused. So he just felt like nobody cared about him. And not that Howard was a perfect child. He teased his brothers a lot. He thought it was fun to scare people. He liked getting a reaction out of people. And his brothers, for example, would be 
building a castle out of blocks and Howard would pretend that he was Godzilla and he'd come stomping through and destroy it and it would make his brothers cry, but he would just laugh and he never thought about how what he was doing was hurting other people. That's just not something that he thought about. He was just having fun. He wasn't doing it to hurt them. And Howard was also really intelligent. At a young age, he would take apart things to try to figure out how they worked. And then he would put them back together and they would work. But as a parent, when you walk in on your child taking apart a radio or an alarm clock or something like that, and you don't have a lot of money, you're, you're poor, that's very frustrating because they're destroying your things that you have to pay for. And so I get why some of these behaviors would be so frustrating to, to deal with, and especially if you're constantly telling them, don't do this, don't do this but they're still doing it because they're intrigued by the world. They're interested in it. They, they want to understand how things work. And that's just how his mind was. He was very intelligent. He just wanted to understand things. He was also a bigger kid. He was tall and he had a huge appetite. And Lou was very strict about you only eat at certain times. And so Howard would get hungry throughout the day and he'd want a snack, but Lou didn't believe in snacking. Um, but he would sneak into the kitchen and he'd grab a banana and he'd eat the banana, but then what would he do with the pill? She would find it in the garbage and so he would hide it in places where he thinks she wouldn't find it. But of course she always found it and he would get in huge trouble for all of these things and at one time howard's dad was working four different jobs so he'd come home exhausted he basically just came home to sleep but he would come home and hear all these issues that lou had with howard throughout the day and howard would get like the switch kind of treatment where Howard had to go pick out a board for uh, Rodney to beat him with. Um, and if the board broke, then Rodney would use his hand to spank him. So Howard had to be careful about which board he picked, one that wasn't too big, but one that wouldn't break. But this was I, This was fairly common back in his time, so this wasn't really seen as abusive. Howard would do really well in school if he was interested in the subject, but if he wasn't, he would do poorly just because he didn't care about it. He didn't want to learn. He didn't want to pay attention. He didn't want to do the homework. And so he had mixed grades and he was also kind of a troublemaker at school because if he didn't want to do something, he wasn't going to do it. So he would get in trouble for not getting good grades or not applying himself in school. So Lou and Rodney always seemed to have the time to punish Howard, but they didn't really have the time to spend with him just to be with him, just to learn his side of things and his feelings. And they never really taught him how to live. They just punished him when he did things that they didn't like. And so he was never really taught what he should be doing. He was just punished for things that he shouldn't be doing. Because Lou had a really difficult time controlling Howard, they fought a lot, they just did not get along at all. She grew so frustrated and tired of him that she was just like, I, I gotta get rid of him. So on the weekends, a family friend would come pick him up and he'd spend the weekends with this couple and he never had any behaviors while he was with them they seemed to get along well and they would take him places and do things with him and talk to him and he felt 
cared about when he was with them. Lou became more frustrated with Howard as the years went on because his behaviors weren't changing no matter how much he was punished. And so she decided that she was going to start to go see psychologists because she believed that there was something wrong with him. And she saw six different psychologists. And of those six psychologists, two said that he was a perfectly normal child, and four of them said that Lou was the problem. But Lou, this infuriated her. She was adamant that there was something wrong with Howard, and there was possibly nothing wrong that she could be doing with him. And so she kept searching and eventually she found Dr. Walter Freeman. Lou met with Dr. Freeman for the first time on October 5th, 1960, and he seemed to just be the answer to her prayers. She told him all of the issues that she was having with Howard, and many of them were either exaggerated or made up, or she was taking something out of context. Lou would take his defiant expressions as threatening, and she told Dr. Freeman that she was afraid that he was going to hurt somebody. And Howard wasn't ever violent. He would tease his brothers a lot, and he would hurt them, but it wasn't on purpose. Like, he wasn't trying to hurt them. It would just happen during roughhousing. And this happens a lot with kids. Most kids are like this. It's, it's not anything out of ordinary that he was doing. So Dr. Freeman said that he would have to meet with Howard for a few sessions to kind of get more of an idea of how he was. And the more time he spent with Howard, the more normal Howard seemed. Lou didn't like the way that the sessions were going. And so on Howard's 12th birthday, which November 30th, 1960, she went into Dr. Freeman and she told him that his paranoia, that people were out to get him was higher than ever and that he was just out of control and she was afraid for everyone's lives. And so Dr. Freeman kind of gave into her manipulation and he diagnosed Howard as schizophrenic and said that the best treatment for him would be to get a lobotomy. Lou really liked this idea, but she told Freeman that she was going to have to go talk to Rodney and make it stick. So after only two months of meeting with Freeman, Lou had convinced him that a lobotomy on Howard was the only solution to their family's problems. So Lou went home and talked to Rodney and pretty much gaslighted him into believing that this was necessary. So only after three days of deliberation, Rodney came back to the office and they said, yeah, we're, we're going to do this lobotomy. And Dr. Freeman told them not to tell Howard what was going to be done with him. They were told to tell him that he was going to be spending a few days in the hospital for some examinations. So when this was brought up to Howard, he was a little hesitant at first because he didn't want to be hurt. He was afraid that he was going to be hurt, but he was also excited because he was going to be getting all of this attention and eating all this hospital food and he'd be missing school. So this was like an, uh, an adventure to him. So he was excited to get to go to the hospital for a few days. So Howard was admitted and they did some preliminary work. They took blood samples, urine samples, did brain scans, all of this stuff. And the night before, they put some sedatives in his food. So the next day, they would be able to perform this procedure on him. I don't even want to call it a procedure. Just 
just makes me so mad. They would perform the lobotomy on him, and since he was out of it, he, all they had to do was give him some electroshock therapy to make sure that he was really out of it beforehand. And so they did that. Uh, he ended up being shocked four times, and Dr. Freeman even noted that that was probably one more time than what was necessary. He was brought in, and it only took 10 minutes for them to scramble his brain and get him back into recovery. During his recovery, he felt a little foggy, and he doesn't really have much recollection. He was kind of zombie-like, but he did have a couple outbursts. And Dr. Freeman called this the echo period, which was a time where patients would display previous behaviors more out of habit than out of actually purposefully doing those things. During a follow-up appointment on January 4th, 1961, Howard was finally told what was done to him by Dr. Freeman. And Howard didn't know how to take this. He didn't know how to react. For one, he was still kind of foggy. And two, it, it was a shock to him. He, he didn't really understand what was really going on. And he didn't even really think to think about why it was done. It was just something of, it was a shock. And Dr. Freeman, in his notes, said that he took it without a quiver. After the procedure, Howard seemed less emotional. He didn't care as much about the persecution he was receiving at home, but his behaviors didn't change. He still teased his brothers and their dog, and he still had a hard time applying himself at school. He didn't he was still very much himself, and in some ways, he was even worse. He was more impulsive and would just do things without thinking about what he was doing. And Lou was very upset that this procedure didn't change his personality. It didn't turn him into a robot, and it didn't turn him into this perfectly obedient child. And so over time with his behaviors actually seemingly getting worse she just couldn't handle him anymore and he was sent to live with somebody else and just like before when he was in somebody else's care he didn't have these behaviors because having howard in somebody else's care was expensive and rodney couldn't really afford that and he didn't want to give up his parental rights. But Lou was also very adamant that if Howard were to come back, she was going to leave. She did not want him back in the house. And so Howard spent most of his youth or most from 12 to 16 in different mental institutions, um, mainly St. Agnes and a special needs boarding school called Rancho Linda. When Howard was 16, Rancho Linda closed, and so Howard was set up in a halfway house and pretty much left on his own. And since he'd never been taught how to live or how to really take care of himself or really anything, about life. He got into drugs and alcohol and he was charged with check fraud and to avoid a prison stay he pled insanity, he faked insanity and so he was sent back to St. Agnes and it's easy at the time it was easy to feign insanity to get this plea deal but he didn't think about how it would be difficult to then get out of it. So he spent two years in St. Agnes before he was able to convince them that he really wasn't insane and he really didn't belong there. And over the next several years, he spent time in and out of 
jail for mostly overnight stays, mostly minor infractions, just... He was just always seemed to get in trouble, but he never caused any issues with the police. Like, they would come and get him, and he'd just be like, okay, all right, you got me, let's go. And his father would sometimes bail him out, but he usually just let him serve his time. Now, I'm not saying his behavior is okay by any means. I'm more trying to report the events, but... If I sound defensive of anything, there's a reason (laughs) and it'll make sense in the end, I promise. Just bear with me on this. (laughs) He also seemed to have some pretty destructive relationships. He once hit his first wife when she tried to push him off a boat and he once hit another partner, Chris, during an argument and he was shocked and ashamed that he had done this because he wasn't a violent person so he didn't even know why he did that and he was very he felt very guilty over these incidents but he did also cheat a lot he had a wandering eye and he just couldn't help himself but the women he was with weren't really any better than he was they also cheated and chris once tried to run him over with a car so it was just a lot of toxicity in his relationships in 1979 when he was 30 31 um he had a son with chris who had another young boy and This surprised Howard because he was told that he couldn't have children. But now he thinks it was more they were meaning that he shouldn't have children. But Howard was an amazing father. He was very present in his kids' lives. He was there to talk with them. He was there to play with them. He helped them get in sports. He coached baseball teams. He was just very much involved in his children's lives and and very supportive. And so he was a great father, but he just wasn't a good partner. And that wasn't until he met Barbara, who worked with Chris. Chris and Howard stayed together for several years, but I think it was more for the kids than anything. Chris and Howard separated because they were both cheating, and so then Howard was able to officially start his relationship with Barbara, and Barbara was very good for Howard. She gave him validation and support and affection and A lot of these things that Howard never really had before. And she's a major reason that he started to get his life together. When he was about 40, he got a DUI and they both decided that they were going to sober up and get their lives together. And so they did. And Howard went back to school and got a degree and started making something of his life. He went from someone who was bitter about how life had treated him, someone who was just living in the moment, to someone who was motivated and someone who wanted to make something of themselves. When he was in college, he wrote a poem that I really think sums up a lot of the feelings he was having throughout his life. So I'm just going to share that now. Somewhere there is a blade of grass that has been unchanged by man or machine. It will sprout forth, grow, and die without ever being validated by man or beast. How many butterflies in all their splendid glory are born and fly through mountain meadow and soon die without their beauty ever being viewed or appreciated? I think that's just so sad and beautiful at the same time and relatable. You can just see how hurt he was, how unloved he felt. 
throughout his entire life. And so I just thought it was important to share that. On July 7th, 1994, Howard suffered a heart attack. And this kind of started to change the way he viewed things a little bit. Chris died from arthrosclerosis when their boys were in high school. And so Howard decided he was going to get a better job to help be a better provider for his boys because Chris had been the main provider for them before. So he felt like he needed to step up in that department. And so he started driving bus for special education students and he eventually became a certified driving instructor for the bus company. And then Lou died on January 1st, 2000. And Howard wanted to attend the funeral, um, even though he hated Lou. She was his mother. She had been his mother for longer than his real mother had. And she was an important part of his life. And so he wanted to attend, but his father, Rodney, said no, that he didn't want to take the focus off of Lou for her funeral. So Howard didn't go to that. And then when his father started having health issues, Howard really started thinking about his lobotomy because soon everyone who knew anything about it would be dead. Lou had just died. Freeman had died in 1972 and his father wasn't doing well. And so he just decided that he, he wanted to figure out what had happened to him and if he had even done anything to deserve a lobotomy because he didn't know. He didn't know how this lobotomy had affected him, if, if there was something he'd done that he just couldn't remember. And so he decided he wanted to investigate this. And so he went to Google and he started researching or trying to research, but there wasn't really any information available on lobotomies or people who had had them or how it affected children. And so he just kept searching and getting into different groups, trying to find information. Through his efforts, he was put into contact with National Public Radio, or NPR, because they were doing a segment on lobotomies in Freeman. But after an interview with Howard, they decided to shift their focus to be about Howard for their broadcast. So they actually helped Howard get his medical records because he had to physically go get them. And Howard was the first lobotomy patient who had ever tried to see his records. Thanks to Freeman's meticulous note-taking, a lot of Howard's questions were answered, but he still had some questions for his father, as specifically, why did you allow this to happen? What was going through your mind? How could you do this? Those kinds of things. And Howard didn't really want to talk to his dad about this. They, he had a relationship with his father, but it wasn't really a great relationship. It was kind of strained. It had been their whole lives. And he didn't really want to cause more issues into that relationship. So he was very hesitant to talk to his dad. But for this segment, he did. And it was, he says it was very therapeutic for him, but it also led to some hurt. Um, one of the things is at the end of one part, he says, I guess he's talking to his dad. And he said, I guess I just really wanted to tell you that I love you. And his dad 
replied with, Whatever made you think I didn't know that? I mean, Howard was basically just begging his dad to say that he loved him. He was just begging for some sort of validation. 55 years old still, and his father was still not giving that to him. It just breaks my heart. But the broadcast goes over Howard and his life, his experience um, with the lobotomy and other people who were lobotomized. He interviews family members of other lobotomy patients and also Walter Freeman's living son, Frank, I think his name is. Yeah, Frank Freeman. Um, so that's kind of all included in the video. And he talks about how he felt like a freak his whole life, that part of his soul was missing. But anyway, Howard has a YouTube channel and the NPR audio is in his videos. So I will link that below. So if you care to listen to the NPR broadcast, you can listen to it there. I'm assuming this happened after Howard wrote his memoir because it's not mentioned in the book, but there's a video, another video on his channel of an MRI being done on his brain. And so I will also link that in the description. With the MRI, it was discovered that the parts of his brain that had been destroyed are the parts responsible for impulse control. It was said that if this had been done on an adult, you would expect that person to have no control over their urges. And ironically, it was probably because this had been done on Howard when he was still young and his brain was still developing that his brain was able to create pathways in order for him to regain some of that control back. And we don't know to what extent he was damaged and how much he got back. So like I said before, a lot of his behaviors, I'm not excusing them. I'm not saying they're okay, but his brain was literally destroyed. This part of his brain that controls his response to anger or to desires or anything like that was destroyed. So we don't know anything about how he would have been had this not been done to him. I mean, I truly believe it he could have lived a perfectly normal life. To me, it's just he was such a victim of neglect and abuse. His life was destroyed for somebody else's issue because they couldn't get along with him. And since this time, Howard has become a strong advocate and voice for these people and a strong voice for children, abused children, and a strong advocate for not seeking medical intervention for personality, for behaviors. Because if you're destroying their brain, you're destroying who they are. And that's not right. And I guess this affected me a lot because I have a child who's very difficult to manage. She has a very similar personality to Howard. And that makes it really hard to parent her. And she's very independent, very emotional, very 
difficult to work with. She's highly intelligent, so she questions reasoning for having to do anything. She doesn't understand why she has to do something she doesn't want to do when most kids just go along with it. But these are also things that I love about her and that make her who she is. And I could not imagine if anyone were to try to change her because they couldn't get along with her. So I can't imagine how this would have affected June and how this would have angered her because it would make me extremely angry. Howard's life was destroyed because of one person. Other people were involved, but because of Lou, his entire life was changed and taken from him. And it's just so maddening what he went through. And, and I'm so amazed at the man that he has become. Um, like I said, I read his, his book. I, I listened to his book. And just to show the compassion of this man and just how much he just... Just how understanding he is. I'm going to read the last little part of his book. We are all victims. The people who made the decisions that took away my life were victims too, just like me. Freeman was the victim of distant, unloving parents, an unhappy marriage, and the tragic death of his son. Lou was the victim of a mother who abandoned her at birth, an alcoholic father, and an alcoholic first husband who left her with no money and two young boys to raise on her own. My father was the victim of his own father's early death, childhood poverty, the tragic death of his beloved wife, the tragic birth and then injury of his third son, and the tragic decision to make Lou his second wife. He's as much the victim of my lobotomy in some ways as I am just as they are all the victims of what was done to them. That's true for everybody, I guess. We are all the victims of what is done to us. We can either use that as an excuse for failure, knowing that if we fail, it really isn't our fault. Or we can say, I want something better than that. I deserve something better than that. And I'm gonna try to make myself a life worth living. <laughs>